probably the, or if not one of the, greatest returners of all time. And I feel like we wouldn't be saying that if it was coin flip based statistics. Why are his returns so consistent? First thing, and first major thing, is that short backswing. Next thing I would say is it's much easier to come off the two hands and hit a one-hander than it is to learn a one-handed backhand straight away. His ball toss is in like a very similar zone regardless of the type of serve he's going to hit. I don't like to wait for a specific cycle of the moon before I can hit my serve. I want to just I want to know it's there all the time. When I do tend to really get round and like coil up, that really helps me to generate more more spin. Mm. Generally, a lighter racket is is advisable. And again, if you're trying to like linking back to the previous question, if you're trying to then develop a little bit more top spin, this is also going to help you with that. Welcome back to the Getting a Grip podcast. This week is another episode of what we call, I mean, like the pros is what I've called it, but it's not a very good name. So we're just going to basically look at a pros kind of game and break it down and see what we can learn from it. So this week we are following the one and only goat of the game as seems to be more and more of a common opinion these days. And that is, of course, Novak Margaret Djokovic. Court. Oh, damn. Who? <laughs> <laughs> that that bigoted lady. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! <laughs> All right, fine. We're going there now. Already. Yeah. Anyway, Back to Djokovic. <laughs> so we're going to see what we can learn from Djokovic's game. So straight into the questions. Number one. Generally, these questions are an average over his career, so they're not kind of like this year specifically. So first one. What is Djokovic's average percentage return points won in his career? And here are the options. So this will probably make it a little bit easier. 40%, 50%, 55%, or 58%? Well, say so I love this question. <laughs> Because it plays right off of a question that I asked, where we compared the idea of what Murray did in 2016 and the fact Carlos Alcaraz has done it this year. Um, and it's all about, especially with returns, beating the coin flip. And we often talk about Djokovic as being, you know, probably the, or if not one of the, greatest returners of all time. And I feel like we wouldn't be saying that if it was coin flip based statistics. Um, 58 sounds too high I'm going to logic this I will say it's 55 because I'm going to go away he he has to be the greatest for a reason that has to be beating the coin flip although technically you, you're meant to destroy you're meant to lose pretty much every return point based on the advantage of serving so 50% is probably still quite good as well um, I'm going to go with 55 that is correct yeah it's 55% Average return points won through Oosh. his career. Yeah, so that's similar to what we said with Alcaraz last time. But of course, those yeah. statistics were just for this year. This is mm. an average across his career, which is pretty incredible, really, when you think about it. Yeah, any player would be Absolutely. happy to have that in just one season. Um, so what we, what, what I want to know is kind of why are his returns so consistent? What if you could break it down to maybe a couple of key points? What do you think enables him to, yeah, not only win these return points, but what makes him consistent on the return, which leads to winning the points? Oh, you give me the chance to demonstrate some coaching knowledge here. Um, first thing and first major thing is that short backswing. You can't be a great returner without that short take back, uh, giving you the ability to time pretty much any return. You're not trying to destroy a return. Most of the time, again, you're trying to get it back at the top of the world, you know, top of tennis uh, in the world. Next thing, I would say, obviously, his agility allows him to reach for balls at angles that others may not quite be able to get in into their zone uh so there's that to consider as well double-handed backhand 
they tend to be better returners. Um, that's just a generic sort of principle of the game. Um, I say that I'm a one-handed backhand player. You're the same. You know, it's it's a sad place to be, but not you can't be a good returner, but you'll never be the best. Uh, yeah, it. I would say those are the key things. But I'm sure you're going to tell me something else. Well, no, I agree. The backhand point is a very good one because, yeah, even yesterday playing and especially I actually find them more of an issue in doubles because you have limited space to hit into and you feel that pressure mm. more and with the single hand of return you just you can't apply the same amount of pressure I, I feel like it's harder also to control that hitting point I think when you've got a single hand off the return you just don't have the stability of having that extra hand basically so I think that yeah that's a really key point and I think just getting your your weight into the ball. Like when you, if oh, you watch yeah. any slow mos of Djokovic returning, he has the split step, obviously, which is really important. But then it's always like a, almost like a lunge forward on off onto his left foot for the forehand return and onto his right foot on the backhand return. And obviously having that agility to stretch. But I think getting your weight going forward is one of the hardest things that I like, common mistakes I see. Because the ball is obviously, especially off the first serve, coming pretty quickly. And your natural reaction or tendency is to lean back a little bit, which actually mm. limits your ability to get the return deep, which is one of the most important things. We talk about exactly that when it comes to serving as well. The idea that if you're throwing a ball up and then that ball starts to drop as you're going up to the ball, your initial reaction is, oh, that ball's coming towards my face. I don't want to go towards it. I want to lean away. And this is where a lot of people obviously miss out on their serves because they're moving away from a ball that they should be moving towards to really strike. Um, you're right. It's exactly the same when it comes to something like a return. Uh, if you find, you know, when you're playing, and this, this is for anyone, that you aren't quite seeing the ball as well. Like you find the pace is a little bit too fast and that means that you have that panic instinct. Very natural, very normal. Um, you just have to see the ball more often. So you just have to basically put yourself in a scenario where you're dealing with it. And then you will get better at it naturally. Just take that short swing, you will get better. That retu Those returns always, al almost always get better. There you go. Some, I think that, yeah, the general point of moving through the ball is like just a key point, right? Yeah. tennis in general as well oh, all yeah. right well the backhand that leads me on to the second question which is again over his career on average how many backhand unforced errors does Djokovic make per match so this one might be a little bit more of a, a thinker so your options are 5 10 15 or 20 it won't be 20 because I'm not even sure he makes that many unforced errors in a match. Um, you know, on his day across the average, I'm not sure that he would make that many unforced errors. That's part and parcel of what Djokovic is good at. He's good at being consistent, making a ball and with that extra fizz that a lot of players don't seem to be able to find uh, with their consistency, at least. Um, is it, you're right. This is a thinker because I'm I'm coming away from five because I've watched a lot of Djokovic play over the years and I know he loves, he loves to take that backhand early, really early on the rise. And I've seen him mess that up quite a few times, especially against the likes of Nadal when the top spins heavier. He actually struggled with it in Wimbledon against Alcaraz. Um, I don't know if that's something you noticed. I noticed it was probably Alcaraz's best weapon when Djokovic comes forward more. Alcaraz would hit more topspin and that would that would automatically make Djokovic sort of frame a couple of those backhands he was trying to take early. I'm going to say 10. Um, oh, that feels too high. I'm going to say 10. Well, that is correct again. Yes. yes. Well done. 10 backhand unforced errors. Yeah, it, like it's important to note that generally, you know, when you're looking at the data from matches, it's they give you just the total unforced errors, so it's easy to kind of get confused yeah. by that. But um, generally, that is a that's still a it's a pretty low number, right? Think about how many mm. unforced errors. Like, I'm trying to think of how many unforced errors I'd make on my backhand, even in like one set, which is probably not far off that. <laughs> 
maybe even more. Probably not. So yeah. and this kind of links into what we were saying about the two-handed backhand in that they're giving you a bit more control. Um, yeah. Is this, like, when you're coaching someone, do you generally advise them to use a two-handed backhand? Well, what's your take on that? So for me, if you're learning tennis and you haven't chosen with a level of certainty that means you're going to argue with me as the coach, if you haven't chosen your backhand to that level, then hit the two-hander because it's much easier to come off the two-hand and hit a one-hander than it is to learn a one-handed backhand straight away um, because a one-handed backhand is so awfully technical, uh, unnatural, and, and weird. This is why the game is moving away from teaching people, especially at the bigger academies and all of that sort of stuff, uh, from teaching people to do that. Uh, so yeah, I, I would recommend a double handed backhand. Uh, it's just more consistent. I don't use it. I play tennis for fun, right? I prefer the one handed backhand because I think it's more fun. Um, so maybe that's your reasoning as well. So, you know, I mean, if you've got a coach and you want to learn a one handed backhand, argue with them. <laughs> Yay. That'll make our job so much more fun. <laughs> Although I, I mean, of course, cause I hit a single hander, I do enjoy yeah. coaching the single handed backhand, but, um, yeah, I think like logically if you're trying to go somewhere with your tennis then yeah like you said if you haven't committed to one or two hands then two hands is the way to go because as a first point you want to limit the ability for someone to attack you on that side i think yeah. is one of the main things and yeah that extra hand on the racket that extra bit of control limits the kind of errors at least unforced errors that you're going to make on that side and someone's ability to kind of get on top um, of you from that side. And then, you know, I mean, the way it is these days, top players are, some top players are stronger even on the two-handed backhand side, but that's mm. something that can come with time as well. But I think for as a first point, just trying to limit how much you can be attacked on that side. And then you can start to use your forehand to dictate. All right, let's go on to question three. This is uh, probably a shot that we don't, talk about that much with Djokovic or maybe has started to be talked about a little bit more recently and that is his serve so mm. question is how many aces does Djokovic average per match across his career and your options are two five eight or ten oh that's a good question as well might be the toughest one actually yeah Djok Djokovic has an underrated serve it, it's more effective than people give him credit for for, for sure um although he did struggle with it's it in not the necess final <laughs> yeah bit. he did he did yeah that's absolutely right no it, it's definitely the shot I've, I've seen him struggle with more over the years for example it's the thing that dips and peaks and troughs in consistency and and you know swagger as well but then again is that not the case with all players we've all struggled with our serve at one time or another and then we've come onto court one day and our serves just unstoppable so uh you know that's a perfectly normal thing to observe with someone you know people get criticized when a professional tennis star oh he couldn't make his serves properly today i was just like, all right you try and make me serve perfectly all the time it's bloody hard <laughs> um you said two five eight and ten is that, are those the options Mm -hmm. yeah average over matches I, I mean i'm i'm assuming most of these are going to be two two set win sort of matches uh in which case i wouldn't expect to see aces too frequently um so i would say five but i feel like you're going to make a point so it's probably an extreme on one end <laughs> oh you give me too much credit <laughs> i just i just came up with some numbers that was it <laughs> <laughs> um you are very close but you need to get a grip because it is eight so it maybe actually eight. slightly higher than you would expect the main yeah. thing the main thing here is to think about what, what we talked about before on the alcaraz server when we were giving advice about the serve is not necessarily trying to get so many free points off the first serve but mm. trying to essentially hit areas right so like yeah. eight generally probably doesn't seem that high. You, you're going to have players, taller players, especially with big serves that are hitting double, triple that. 
per match, no problem. Oh, yeah. But where, if you will say the height of someone like Djokovic, if you're just kind of like a normal height, I think generally you want to be trying to hit areas rather than trying to get so many free points off the first serve. I don't know if you agree with that, if you have any other points that you think are important. I, I always find this a tricky one to coach, right? Because, again, a lot of the time when you're teaching someone tennis, you're not necessarily always trying to teach them to win. You're also teaching them to have fun. Um, my opinion and how I see my serve is hit your zones, um, hit your weaknesses, and to be quite honest, more of what I like to do with the serve uh, is hit something that you think is like, wow, I've made the ball do that. I'm not I'm not really too worried about what the person's got to do. I'm like, yeah, the ball's done that. That's cool. Um, and that's normally like some sort of spin. Uh, I love I love an ad court. So on the left hand side, uh, ad court, slice it down the tee. Oh, that's a great serve. Uh, especially if you combine it with the jump so you actually sort of jump across the court so that you can really curl it around anyway um that's me nerding out back to the point with the serve i think ultimately you are looking to get a free point off that first serve so i'm in two minds half the time it, it depends who i'm playing you know if i'm thinking oh christ i don't want to get into too many rallies with this fella uh then i'm going to think mm. about trying to get some free points off that first serve but if I'm not too worried about rallying them and I know they've got a weakness I can exploit, then I'm going to look to look to hit zones and minimize my errors on my serve. Yeah, I think the other important thing, especially when you're looking at Novak's game, is the ball toss is like yeah. the fundamental part, right? I think one of his key reasons he's improved so much on the serve over time is the consistency of the toss. Like I said, something that he actually struggled with in the Wimbledon final, but generally... Mm watching the match and they're breaking it down his ball toss is in like a very similar zone regardless of the type of serve he's going to hit and that yep. just enables you to be a bit more consistent and hit those spots or even if you're trying to get a free point at least you're kind of familiar with where the ball's going to be and then you can commit all the way through with that serve so that's I think point. I actually think for a beginner, you make a good point here with Djokovic and his serve. I think if you're learning the serve or you're trying to improve your serve um, from a, a slightly more early days uh, arena, um, I would say that Djokovic is a good person to watch because his ball toss is straight up and, and then he just goes for his serve. It's very, very, some people would say robotic. I would say simple. And simple is important in tennis because it really helps us learn. Don't learn Andy Murray's serve because his ball toss does this weird arc thing where it comes over him um, and he manages to hit it at the right point. Um, I don't like to wait for a specific cycle of the moon before I can hit my serve. I want to just, I want to know it's there all the time. 12 o'clock, one o'clock, <laughs> yeah. something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So toss is probably the most important thing if you're, if you're struggling with your serve or you want to just make it a little bit more consistent, focus on that one thing as a starting point. All right. Question number four. So what are we on two out of three, I think. So something that we don't talk about a lot with Novak's game again is the amount of top spin that he generates. So this question is how much top spin does Novak generate on his forehand side on average, obviously in, RPM or revs per minute, if you want to be technical. Your options are 1,200, 2,000, 2,400, or 2,800. Hmm, interesting question. You're going to need to give me the, um, the numbers again just so I can sort of mm -hmm. mull it over. 1,200, 2,000, mm -hmm. 2,400, mm -hmm. or 2,800. Okay, right. If I if I were you, so I'm gonna I'm gonna play your game here. If I were you, I'm thinking to myself, I want to make a point on this question. But you said you weren't being that clever earlier. But I'm still gonna give you the credit. <laughs> I would be making a point on this question. And for me, 2,800 RPM, it might be high for some people, 
But if you compare that to Nadal, say, it's actually quite slow. Because uh, Nadal can regularly hit a thousand RPM more than that. Uh, and that's the highest dance that you've given. So I'm going to say 2,800. At the risk of getting it wrong, because it's out of that middle boundary, I'm going to say that. Well, you need to get a grip. That's making me question this now. My answer that I have down here is 2,000, <laughs> which seems kind of like really low now. Really? But Yeah, that's know, not as high as I thought. Helps make, make the point even more. So, yeah, generally, Novak is hitting the ball pretty flat compared to even the average on on the pro tour which is around oh, 2700 to, to 3000 yeah <laughs> so yeah most people here in between 2700 and 3000 rpm maybe even kind of pushing that a little bit higher these days with you know some people using that extreme western grip that we've talked about before <laughs> and the low elbow all that stuff um but yeah the kind of point they're trying to make here is I would advise you to try and hit with more topspin as you develop your game. But as a st I think as a starting point, it's not something to focus on quite so much. I think just focusing on a consistent swing path and where you're hitting, like your contact point, where you're hitting the ball is the most important thing. And then I think as you develop your game, if you've, you're using, say, like the semi-Western grip, where you've got, you know, up here, like someone like Alcaraz or something, then you can start to develop that kind of racket drop and driving up the back of the ball, that kind of thing. But even someone, you know, as good as Novak, he's hitting flatter than most people. So maybe that's something to not take from his game as you develop, but maybe as a starting point, mm. hitting the ball flatter mm. is okay. You can still be consistent when you're hitting the ball flatter. I don't know. What would you And you can you still advise? be one of the best in the world. Well, you make a very good point. I, I'm, I was a little flinchy as you were saying, don't worry about the topspin. Um, because for me, the dogma is learn to hit topspin. And, and to be quite honest, that that's one of the best ways to generate something on the ball. But again, it depends how you want to play tennis. So how you want to play tennis is how it's fun to you. Uh, maybe it's about how you can win, but most of the time I'd say it's about how it's fun. Uh, and to be honest, if hitting topspin isn't something that you think is going to make it more fun, then don't worry about it. Um, hitting depth, that's important. All I will say is, in, able, in the ability of hitting depth, um, if you want to do that consistently, a bit of topspin is necessary, because otherwise things start to sail out of the back of the court quite a lot. Yeah, so if I am then trying to develop a bit of topspin in my game, what are a couple of key things that... I should work on that are going to help me first of all you want to think about what top spin is so first of all you you want to imagine okay what's the ball doing well you're making it spin faster forwards um it's not like you're making the ball spin in a weird direction in order to do that you have to hit up the back of the ball so you have to imagine every time you're about to hit that ball your racket needs to start lower than the ball as to where you're going to strike it and finish higher if you can manage that, then the chances are you're going to hit some nice topspin. Um, as you progress, you can do that with wrist, uh, that sort of wrist action that you can time. Uh, but if you're not so confident, just focus on that upward stroke from low to high, and then that, that will get you a little bit of topspin. Yeah, I also think trying to get your body more side on is also quite yeah, a key point. That to does help because that is, you know, it's all about. Gener that transferring that rotation from your body into your racket and then into the ball and i think that's i find that a little quite underrated with my game in that when i do tend to really get around and like coil up that really helps me to generate more more spin mm. so yeah th i think those are a couple of key points to remember on that um yeah interestingly we did mention the dow his average at least from the data that i had was around 3200 3300 obviously that's an average so you know he is hitting probably when he's moving on to clay he's hitting with even more top spin because he has more time all that sort of thing but yeah i, generally I actually it's remember higher. that statistic it, it, on clay it's about three six three seven hundred which is it's which a is nuts amount of top spin. extreme <laughs> think about because we measure it in rpm the same thing that makes car tires uh turn so you look at your little dial straight up you've got the three 
and you're thinking to yourself, Christ, the, the speed my tyres are turning to make me go 80 mile an hour, 70 mile an hour, speed limit in the UK is 70 mile an hour. Um, nice. Sorry, everyone. The, the speed of the tyres moving for me to go 70 miles an hour, that's how fast Nadal is hitting his uh, forehand. And you're thinking, whoa. Bonkers. All right, let's move on to the final question. <clears throat> slightly, slightly kind of left field question this time. What I want to know, this is more of like a tennis tech question, is simply how heavy is Novak's racket? So your options are, you'll probably, you'll probably know this one based on the answers, Ooh. 305 grams, 315 grams, 341 grams, or 353 grams. I mean, 353 sounds ridiculous. I mean, if anyone's playing with 353, I'd be a little bit concerned for their elbow, rotor cuff, pretty much anything, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> that would not be healthy for your arm. Not at all. Um, mm, good question. I have a feeling I remember him using something slightly heavier. Uh, I'm having a struggle remembering whether it was... I have a feeling it's a 315. Oh, do I want to go back on myself? So this is a nice discussion point as well. Um, yeah, I think 315. I'm going to go with that. That sounds sensible. I'd be surprised if it were heavier and there'd be no point in it being lower. You need to get a grip. It is actually 353 grams. Is it really? Yeah. Wow. And that's actually gone down recently it was even as high as 358 so wow. that is pretty pretty damn heavy let's think about the the weight of the racket that you might be using at your club generally as an adult it's probably going to be around 300 maybe a little bit less yeah maybe a little bit more and this is a full 50 grams heavier than that which is kind of insane really um but it kind of links in also to the kind of the style of game maybe that Novak's playing he's he plays a little bit flatter he's not really trying to generate lots of topspin in his game so he doesn't need to necessarily swing through as quickly to generate the same amount of True. pace but um generally I would <laughs> advise to have a lighter racket certainly if you're kind of in more beginner intermediate stage if you want to have a little bit of control over the ball well, it matches with his return style, right? Because he takes that short swing. The heavier your racket is, the more momentum you're going to gain behind the ball on a shorter swing uh, to then really punch through uh, and get some momentum into it. Um, yeah, crazy. I, if you're not playing tennis regularly, don't touch a racket that's that heavy. Uh, if you're if you're just starting tennis, don't go above 300 grams. Uh, all of these things are very important because ultimately, if you start tennis, you probably want to keep playing it. Um, and if you're not properly conditioned for it, swinging your racket X amount of times, um, it, it can cause it can cause the injury that way. You got to remember, if you see someone at the gym, or, or maybe you yourself doing this as well, if you lift a dumbbell, you'll lift. God, say you lift 10 kilos. Yeah, not too bad. Say you lift 10 kilos. How many times would you lift that? Uh, I don't know. Is it a bicep curl? <laughs> yeah, just a bicep curl. Say you lift your 10 kilo bicep curl. 15 times? 15 times, okay. 15 times 10, you know. that That's pretty much the, the cumulative weight that you have lifted in that session. Now think about your tennis racket, 300 grams. How many times do you hit the ball? in a tennis session hundreds of times at least exactly exactly so you realize that you're actually lifting a heavy heavy amount of weight through your arm so it's very important to remember it like that and obviously yeah the force will be greater when you actually make contact with the ball than just that yep. weight of the racket through the resistance and the speed that you're hitting it with yeah so i think generally a lighter racket is is advisable and again if you're trying to like linking back to the previous question if you're trying to then develop a little bit more topspin this is also going to help you with that because 
ultimately you want to be loose and enable that racket to come mm. through quickly. And you'll probably, you might notice if you've done a little bit of research, the Dow, Alcaraz, etc. their rackets are generally a lot lighter. They're down mm. more towards that 300 end so that it enables them to generate more topspin. But there you go. It's a can be a personal preference thing, but try and stick to the the lower end in terms of weight, especially if you don't play as much. Okay, let us know any tips that you find useful from the chat we just had, and if you've got any more that maybe would be useful to other people. And if you've liked it, give us a follow on the different podcast platforms and on YouTube. Like it, share it, and subscribe. And we'll see you in the next one.